Electric cars actually were considered premium. Rich cars wanted electric cars because they were silent, they were fast. For example, this car, it's called the Toujours uh, Jamme Content, was the first car to break the 100 kilometer barrier back in 1899, and it was electric. Uh, and so at the time, the premium part where Mercedes and Tesla and BMW is, was mainly electric. Because cars, electric cars at the time also had a big advantage. They started always at the first try. Because gas cars at the time not always started at the first try. Uh, we are going to show a few models from them. This was the first production model, uh, the 1884 L. Parker. Uh, an English car that actually started production one year earlier than the known Daimler car that supposedly is the most the first production car because it's elect a gas car but not electric. The first electric production car started one year before. And this is the 1900 Loader Porsche. The first Porsche was electric. On this case, a uh, uh, mixed state electric because it had batteries, but when the batteries ran out, it had a small gas engine to provide energy for them. Basically, this was a Chevrolet Volt in 1900. Uh, the car had uh, options of four wheel drive, which you can see, uh, the small uh, cubs in the wheels, but they also have an option for two wheel drive which was something revolutionary at the time and uh, it was something that Tesla says that makes cars better, all-wheel drive and this one proves it because all-wheel drive were top of the range then on this model. This model was actually driven on several rallies by Ferdinand Porsche which won several rallies in Europe at the time. So it was a fast car and successful one. Uh, this is probably the best known uh, brand at the time, Detroit Electric. Uh, it sold around 30,000 units back at the first uh, stage of electric cars. And the, a little known fact is that at a certain point around 1910, 30% of the American auto market was electric, 30%. Imagine that. And 70 years after, we came to the second phase of the electric car. Uh, back in the late 80s and early 90s, Greenpeace and other movements were calling for a better sustainability and more ecological measures. So, in Europe, uh, a certain number of brands like Peugeot, Citroën, Renault started to make electric versions of their models. This is the best-selling car of that time. 7,000 Peugeot 106 electric were sold at the time. But the real battleground was here, the United States. Uh, in 1996, General Motors launched the EV1 which became a little like a poster child for electric cars at the time. Uh, but GM wasn't, uh, didn't want to sell actually to customers, they only leased it. So 2,000 units were made, but in 2002, we got, uh, GM got back the cars and destroyed them. A lot of things happened, and a lot of people were outraged by it. A lot of initiatives tried to uh, bring back the electric car, but none of them succeeded. So in 2006, Max Payne uh, created this documentary called Who Killed the Electric Car? And we are going to see a trailer about it. And uh, you can follow the the trend back and you can see that each and every month since 2013 sales have been increasing all the time. 
continuously. And if you summarize it, looking at it year by year, it has been rapid growing since 2008. So this, this is actually Norway, and Norway looks like this. And what is interesting about Norway is that electric vehicles last year were 19% of car sales in Norway. And for this year, we can probably estimate that they will hit over 26% in electric vehicle share uh, in total cars. And um, yeah, like the picture that Sack showed before, the, the adoption rate, well, theory tend to say that you have a tipping point if a technology goes up to 15, somewhere in between 15 and 18% market share, it is, uh, you can deem it successful. And Norway is somewhere already uh, going into the early majority, um, meaning that in a few years we will probably see Norway coming up to over 50% market share of EVs. This is actually last year's um, growth in different countries, and most important here is China and Europe. China grew by 227%. 33% of the electric vehicles today are produced in China, and almost none of them are being exported. Uh, maybe a few of them, but not even a percent. So this is only to meet uh, the, the local demand in China. And in Europe, the most uh, produced is the BMW i3, which is uh, selling globally. Great car, I, I drove it once. EVs will actually cost less than uh, comparable internal combustion engine cars in a few years. And another point is that governments have very high commitments. And I don't want to beat a dead horse, but uh, so Norway has been following the adoption curve, but Tesla also has in its market segment. So we've seen also it's followed this uh, disruptive technology curve in the luxury, large luxury car market. So now it's dominating that market. It, we're expecting similar in the small luxury car market with the Tesla Model 3. It looks like uh, it will do the same thing, dominate the market. So we're seeing one company follow this curve already. Oh, I, I just wanted to add in that uh, with the adoption rate, like, go back 10 years when uh, the, the smartphone came. What, what about the smartphones today? I mean, nobody would guess that one company would have almost 50% of the market of the <coughs> smartphones. And a lot of uh, skeptics said that who, who needs a computer in the telephone? Like, yeah. and um, look today, <laughs> is there anyone without a smartphone here? Yeah. We can probably count that on one hand. Yeah, we've been following that market closely. I, I'll let them talk in a second. But uh, we've been, I was just at BYD's headquarters in LA, and they actually, the next day, interviewed us uh, for a documentary they're doing about electrification of transport. Um, we, I can tell you, the main thing is they've sold thousands of electric buses in Chinese cities and all across Europe, the US, uh, elsewhere. They've been doing small pilot projects for the past several years. All of these pilot projects, as far as I know, have shown that they're cost competitive and that they're a better option. But there's still these, these agencies and cities and countries have been slower to, to make big orders. I can say uh, there were a number of orders in the pipeline that I saw that we can't talk about yet. But still, it's taking a while because of a lot of bureaucratic issues uh, with these agencies for bigger adoption. But for right now, they're cost competitive. So I think it's again about getting awareness out there. Um, yeah, the bigger vehicles in general are where you're going to have the savings quickest. So we, we try to highlight any electric bus store we find. It's still hard to find big ones for the US market. But uh, you guys can talk about the sales. You're tracking sales, right, for electric buses. Yeah, it's very hard to have tracking uh, buses, but the few data that I have, it says that uh, it's a more rational decision, so it's harder to change, but once it does, uh, the numbers are really high. For example, when a company finally decides to buy electric buses, they buy not one, not two, but 15 or 20. I, in fact, know that the American company decided to go all electric, in California, and it will buy by in bulk. Like this year, we will buy ten, 
Next year we will buy another 10 and that's how the bus market works. Yeah.